Welcome back and I hope everyone had a great new year and holiday season. We've taken a few weeks off to work on some of the projects that are going to be starting this coming year and we have a lot coming for you. So I want to give you a little heads up of some of the things that you can expect coming from this show. First off, there are a few weeks left, probably another one or two weeks, that we're going to keep the discounted sales price, the holiday price, for Read This Before Medical School, our book, which is available on Amazon and through freemeded.org slash medstudent. And remember, this is not just for pre-meds. This is not just for before medical school. It is for current medical students as well. So please get your discounted copy now before the price goes back up. As for some of the show that's going to come up, we have a few more interviews to post, some really great interviews, including today's, but we also are going to do a different theme for a mini-series coming up that's going to be a summation of some of the best material from 2019. So if you're newer to the show and you don't want to go back and listen to every episode, I know medical students are short on time sometimes, we are going to give you the highlights in a best of mini-series for, for medical mnemonics, for learning skills, and for board exam skills. Lastly, a new service that I'm thinking about starting is a consultation with me personally. And I might do this for free for a couple of weeks or for a limited number of students to test it out at first and then possibly add a minimal fee to it after that just to compensate for some of the time expense that it's going to take. These consultations can be for study techniques, they can be for board exam techniques, to practice your medical mnemonics, whatever you want them to be, some way to really give back to the community and help you guys out. So let me know what you'd like. Send me some messages if you have any specific requirements that you would like to practice. And links to schedule these will be in the upcoming future show notes. So make sure to, to keep updated and to subscribe to the show so you are updated with all of the new information coming out. So without further ado, let's begin today's show. Welcome to the Medical Menemis Podcast, your source for memory techniques and accelerated learning in higher education. Now, here's your host, Chase DeMarco. Jonathan Levy is a serial entrepreneur, published author, and podcaster born and raised in Silicon Valley. He has discussed productivity and learning skills development in his TEDx talks, numerous courses on Udemy, and through the Becoming Superhuman podcast. Today, Jonathan is going to help us all in our journey to become medical super learners. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Jason. I'm really excited to be here. I am too. This is going to be a great episode and getting a lot of, I guess, variations of topics we've already covered, but from a very, very experienced instructor in, in a lot of these topics. I mean, from just your Udemy followers, I think you have over 186,000. We just broke 200. Oh, we just you? broke wow. 200 this week. Yeah. Oh boy. So lots and lots of teaching experience in all kinds of productivity, mnemonics training, super learning. But I guess we should start off for the audience. What is a super learner? Yeah. So a super learner is someone who is able to I won't say effortlessly, but who is able to fluently dive into a learning subject, no matter the size, and really gain a level of not just competence, but almost mastery without fear, trepidation, anxiety, or hurdle. It's someone who's able to learn huge amounts in a single bound, to take from the metaphor of uh, Superman and is able to kind of confidently approach any topic, right? Because if you can only learn one type of thing efficiently, effectively, or in an expert way, I wouldn't consider you a super learner and consider you a subject matter expert. Whereas if you can dive into a variety of subjects and really be a true polymath and learn all of them with an incredible pace, that's what I would consider a super learner. Got it. So from a medical point of view, one of the most common sayings when you're going through medical school is it's like drinking out of a fire hose. There are so many different topics and you need yep. to learn relative mastery of a lot of these quickly. So this sounds like the perfect type of skill set for medical students and, and other healthcare students. I would agree. And I would say, you know, more and more, and I argue this in, in my latest book, I actually talk about medical students specifically and say, you know, this information overload, it started in medicine, right? You know, in, in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, 80s, medicine branched out more and more and more. And I talk about this idea that, you know, there used to be the family doctor 
and that was it. And then there were specialists and now you have specialists within the specialists. You know, you have pediatric orthodontic surgeons and on and on and on. And, but, you know, just because it started in medicine doesn't mean that it isn't reaching everybody. Years and years ago, a programmer was a programmer was a programmer. Today you have, are you front end, back end? Are you on Rails? Are you on Ruby? You know, the entire world is becoming hyper specialized because we're creating so much more knowledge and information. So don't feel that you are alone. You are just on the vanguard because medicine is one of the fastest moving fields, really. Yeah, it seems like it doesn't matter where you are. Everyone's somewhat of an entrepreneur having to wear multiple hats, learn multiple skills, multiple subject matters. I love that. Yeah, I totally agree. So a lot of the topics you cover and being that some of your material, uh, I'd say yours and Anthony Matibius are some of the first things I came across a little over a year ago now when I started learning about accelerated learning and these types of techniques. What are some of them that you really focus on or you think is a good starting point for a new student? Yeah, so I think the first thing that we teach in most of our courses is memory. And I think that's important for a couple of different reasons. You know, I spend a lot of time, Chase, as you know, thinking about the way that people learn on the macro level, on the meta level. I mean, I, I design courses for a lot of the world's top thought leaders. And so I think about how people learn, not just so I can teach them how they learn, but also so I can sneak the medicine in with the sugar, so to speak, in all my programs. And the reason I think memory is so important is partly because of what I teach in the course, because what's the point of learning faster if you can't remember it, store your memories, maintain your memories, all of that is true and valid. But the other reason, and, and I don't talk about this very much, you know, because it's the magician revealing the, the magic trick, but the other reason is so many people walk around with so many misconceptions about memory and specifically about their memory. How many people have you met who say, oh, I have such a lousy memory or my favorite one, which drives me crazy. You meet someone and they go, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not going to remember your name. I have a lousy memory for names. And I'm like, no, you're just an asshole. Yeah, you know, <laughs> you're just a jerk and you're not willing to put in the effort to remember people's names or learn how to do it. You know, that's like saying to your spouse, like, oh, sorry, I'm not going to open the door. I'm just not considerate. <laughs> it's like, no, you would put in the effort and you would become considerate. So we teach memory because it is a massive win for people. And it just like when Lev, who, who was a past guest on your show, taught me about this stuff. It was the first time, Chase, that I ever discovered real world superpowers that you could actually learn. I've always been obsessed with superpowers. I've always loved comic books. And, you know, I tried when I was a kid to, to develop uh, telepathy and telekinesis and it never worked. But this was the first time where I was like, holy crap, this is a real superpower that anyone can learn. And I think that's, you know, my word, if you will, like my guiding word is empowerment. And I think there's nothing more empowering than to unlock within someone this realization like, wow, I can do superhuman feats if I just learn how. And that's why my company is called Superhuman Academy. And it's why the, one of the first things I teach people is this superhuman skill. Because if they're anything like me, and it sounds like if they're anything like you, they go, oh my God, I just learned how to do something superhuman. What else can I do? <laughs> And this is a great way to bring up, uh, so we've kind of covered the credentials of your company in a way that you have tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of followers and past students and the ratings really speak for themselves. And having Lev be, uh, I suppose, your mentor in the past and having him on the show, it might be a good way to discuss your personal credentials to the audience as far as, you know, I know I was not the best student and it sounds like you had some struggles there too. So maybe explain how this personally helped you in the past and how you implemented them. Yeah, well, I was a, I was a pretty lousy student uh, and not for lack of trying. I just could not keep up with other kids in class. And the way that I got through elementary and middle school was I just worked a lot harder than everyone. And I went home and I, I tried to catch up and understand everything that everyone else had understood in class. The way that I got through high school and college was medication so that I could stay longer, work harder, and catch up with what everyone else had understood in class. Um, what this changed for me is more than just the ability to memorize and read faster because I still have a hard time paying attention. If I need to sit still in a classroom for eight hours a day, I still would need to be medicated because I'm an entrepreneur at heart and I'm a creative at heart and I just go crazy 
you know, if I'm just sitting there consuming and not engaging. But what this changed for me was, again, I'm going to use that word, empowerment. It helped me realize like I'm not dumb and I can learn fast and I can learn effectively. And what's more, I mean, anyone who's tried these techniques, one of the first things they always tell me, it's either, wow, it's so much easier than I thought or wow, it's so much more fun than I thought. So it was this realization that I could make learning fun and engaging and entertaining and do it really effectively and not just completely change the way that I viewed myself. I never thought I would be the person to be teaching hundreds of thousands of people all over the world how to learn. And certainly my teachers didn't think so. I feel like I do the same thing. I kind of daydream in class. I can't sit still for a long period of time. I'd rather be doing something hands-on than listening to a lecture. Mm -hmm. And even after learning a lot of these techniques, actually implementing them in every different scenario that you're going to run into is quite difficult. And I hit roadblocks all the time. I try to mention that on the show. It's not necessarily a cure-all, but it's definitely a trained skill. You just might have to train it in different environments. Yeah. And that's why we we offer courses, you know, because it I love this saying, and it gets thrown around a lot in the circles that I'm in, but information alone can't create transformation without application. And, you know, it's exactly that. If the information alone were enough, we would all be billionaires with six-pack abs. But it is that implementation. I mean, this is why we teach online courses. This is why I've spent the last six months training a dozen plus certified coaches who are going to help people apply or who are already helping people apply and implement this stuff and be accountable to actually using it because you'd be amazed, Chase, the number of times, even, I mean, even when I had 50,000, 100,000 students, or I would sit down and I'd be like, all right, I'm going to learn Russian. Okay, the grammar. How do I do the grammar? Well, I'll just wrote, memorize a bunch of the rules and then realize, oh, right, memory palaces, mnemonics, you know, and once you figure it out, it takes 10 minutes. But getting to that point is like, Sometimes we have a saying in Hebrew, uh, the, the shoemaker goes barefoot, happens to the best of us. This is probably a great point to bring up as far as the different tactics you've used in, let's say, different languages. And what I hear from other polyglots could be very applicable to medical students in the aspect that a question I get a lot through social media, through emails is, okay, I started using mnemonics. I started creating visuals, working on my visual dictionary or my memory palace for this course, but... I kind of had to start all over for this other course. It's a very different scheme, different terminology, sometimes not intuitive processes that are going on. Mm. Do you know any similarities between maybe language learning and something as complex as medicine that the students might be able to learn from? You know, Anthony Mativier is also a mentor of mine. And uh, we once had a really long conversation about the difference between systems and methods right? A system is like, just do what I tell you, do it exactly this way. You know, it's a process. Whereas a method is kind of a way of deriving. And he and I both very much fundamentally believe in methods. We believe in teaching people tools that they can then use to adapt because the way that you would learn the Russian grammatical case system, you would apply the techniques very differently as compared to how you would go about memorizing all the tendons in the human body, which is a a, a daunting task for most people. What I would say is this. In my new book, I talk a lot about this idea of preparation. And I'm not talking about preparation like brew yourself a good cup of coffee and, and have a workout where you need to learn. Like Most people in the audience are med students and therefore they understand like, yeah, working out will prepare your brain for learning more. But what I'm talking about when I talk about preparation is, is really something that I learned from my business management coaches, right? It's sitting down and saying, okay, we have a project here. What are the milestones going to be? How am I going to approach this? What are my needs? What, what are the success criteria, right? Like so many times people say, okay, we're going to do this project. Well, how are you going to know if you do a good job or not? And most importantly, one of the biggest realizations, you know, they always say like failing to plan is planning to fail. Well, I'll take it a step further, which is Failing to plan to fail is planning to fail. Let me explain what the hell I mean. We're all humans and everything any human creates is imperfect. And the same is true with a plan. And so if your plan does not take into consideration the fact that you will at some point fail in one way or another, 
For example, you will miss a study session. You will get behind. You will struggle. You will forget something. You will have a headache one day. It doesn't matter. You will fail at some point. So the difference between successful people and people who are less successful is successful people go, if X failure happens, then Y will course correct. Have that plan in place so that it's easy and it's ready. If I miss a study session, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to set aside time on a Saturday. Or even better yet, I'm going to block off every third Saturday just in case. And it's going to be on my calendar and I'm not going to make any plans until 11 a.m. so that I have the time as a fallback, just as an example. But back on the idea of preparation, thinking in advance and going, okay, how many items of information? I mean, just the basic stuff. How many pieces of information is this as compared to to whatever it was in that last course. Okay, well, there are 1,500 different names that I need to memorize. Are those names similar? Do I need to know them in order or by area or by function? How am I going to organize my memory palaces? All of these things, I think, allow you, and and again, touching on the idea of a method, this is part of the method, is asking yourself, how am I going to use this information? How should I be organizing it? And doing that thinking deliberately. Because otherwise you get into a situation like I did with Russian where it's like, great, I know 2,000 words. And then you realize, oh man, I don't exactly know the right 2,000 words and I don't know enough grammar to actually use 2,000 words. And you know that was a lesson hard won. And, and I write all about that in the new book. I think that preparation step is vastly overlooked. And it's something that reminds me a lot of this uh, topic we covered, I think it was episode 31 called WHOOP. It's wish, outcome, obstacle, plan. So what is your wish? And what is the outcome you're really desiring from that wish? How, what's the end goal you're trying to reach? And then planning out based on the obstacles that you can sort of foreshadow, plan a way out of those obstacles. It sounds like a very similar topic to what you're discussing here and something that we really don't prepare for, plan for, think about when we're trying to set goals. I really like that woot. And I'll add one other thing, which, you know, a lot of people talk about this idea of like preparation, thinking ahead. Tim Ferriss has done some work on it. One thing that I've often felt is missing from that argument is to what extent do I need to know this information? Because let's be realistic and let's be practical here, right? Like if I am taking a elective course in European history, that's going to look very different from getting a PhD in European history. If I am taking a mandatory course on endocrinology, it's going to look very different from if that is my actual specialization, right? And so actually asking the question and being pragmatic and saying like, how deep do I want to go down this rabbit hole? And how do I want to use this knowledge? Is this tangential knowledge that I want to connect back? Or am I starting out a whole new neural network here that I really want to be mastery level in. I think that's missing from the conversation as well because no one wants to admit. I think there's there's guilt and shame around doing something like say, okay, I'm going to play the piano, right? I think a lot of people aren't comfortable enough and honest enough with themselves to say, but I don't really want to be that great at the piano. I want to be able to jam, you know, at parties and hang out with friends and play songs by ear. I don't need to be able to compose music. I don't want to be able to play something the first time I hear, you know, but Doing that is going to allow you to properly allot resources. Hmm, that's a good point. So I guess knowing your resources that are allotted to you is a very important step here. But also, I find it might be difficult for medical students to necessarily think in this manner because like you said earlier, it's difficult when we're kind of being trained to be generalists, general practitioners, while also having a focus potentially on a certain specialization in the future. Are we studying for our future goals? Are we studying for the exam? Are we studying just to get out of medical school? And I guess these are questions every individual student is going to have to ask themselves, but it can really change the shape of your plan and the outcomes you're, you're trying to prepare for. Yeah, exactly. I would say so. And, you know, in a perfect world, like speaking as a patient and not a doctor, I would love for my doctor to have 100% perfect index knowledge of every field of medicine. I would love that. But it's not actually necessary because, you know, one of the things they taught me in business school, Chase, is, you know, someone raised a hand and they said, look, it was a particularly arrogant student. They said, look, you know, we're at one of the most elite business schools in the world right now. And none of us, you know, it was an accounting class, financial accounting. 
And hopefully none of us after paying for this fancy degree are ever actually going to have to prepare a set of audited financial books. Like that's, you know, our bookkeeper would do it. And, and the professor said, yes, but you need to know enough to know that it's being done right. You need to know enough to know what to look for. And I think the same is true with a lot of GPs today. You need to know enough to be able to know where to look, to be able to know where to dig deeper, to be able to remember the general idea of something. Do I actually need you to remember the exact number of pathways that magnesium is used in the brain? Probably not, you know? Yeah, it can get infinitely complex with some of these topics. Oh, God, and yes. it's, <laughs> a lot of it ends up being fairly useless in, in clinical practice, at least for the first board exam. And actually, they say most physicians would, like many standardized tests, not be able to pass the test after they've been out of the classroom for a while because it's just not 100% correlated to your actual mm-hmm. clinical practice. Yeah, absolutely. Then let's see if we can make maybe a general roadmap, if you would, for a medical student, maybe... They have a little practice. Maybe they're just starting off. I know you cover memory improvement, speed reading, pre-reading techniques. Where is a place that they should maybe focus on starting if they haven't experienced these yet? Yeah, well, I would say the first step is to rediscover your visual memory. If you haven't, you know, go back and listen to the past half dozen, two dozen, three dozen episodes of Chase's show and really get a feel for because a lot of people still have this misconception like, oh, no, I'm an auditory learner. I do better by turning everything into a song. And No, you don't. <laughs> you know, and, and I used to make that claim and, and I used to say, I'm telling you, I'm telling you that you know, we're all wired to be visual learners. And da, da, da. In 2017, the Riken MIT Center actually proved that <laughs> there's no memory without visualization and location. Memories are inextricably linked to pictures and location in our brain. And, uh, and you know, the Picoer Institute for Brain Research has done some incredible work around this as well. You're a visual learner, you know, and I always tell people like, if you've ever said, gosh, I wish I had a photographic memory, good news, you do. You just don't know how to use it yet and it's been lying dormant. You know, imagine if today I told you that you had, you actually all along, you've had a third arm on your back, but you've never used it before. So it's really, really weak. But if you train it, you'll have three arms. You know, it's, it's the same idea. Like you've never trained your visual memory, but once you use it, it's going to be incredibly strong and powerful. And so the first place to start is by creating these mnemonics. And then soon after that, specifically for medical students, soon after that, I would want you to get very comfortable. <laughs> it, traveling around in your mind, in other words, creating memory palaces, because the sheer amount of information that doctors contend with, the only way you can really practically do it in an efficient manner is through the memory palace and and through training that skill and adapting that skill. It is the most time-tested, I'm sure your audience has heard it a million times, but it is the most time-tested, proven, and effective memory technique. In fact, in my book, uh, The Only Skill That Matters, I call it the mnemonic nuclear option because using a memory palace for everyday tasks is a lot like showing up to a street skirmish with a thermonuclear weapon. It's that effective. (laughs) I love it. I think I kind of used a similar terminology that I probably originally heard from you in in my recent book, kind of describing these and how you can utilize some of these memory techniques in medicine. Awesome. So from developing your creativity and your visual memory and getting these uh, visual dictionaries, as I sometimes refer to them, I forget where I probably heard that initially, if it was yours or maybe Anthony Mativier, but there seem to be a lot of rules that some people use. And like you said, you and Anthony Mativier have discussed methods and methods don't give you necessarily a strict strategy, just some tools to use. And he has many different tools that he recommends. Are there any particular ones you recommend, such as starting in like a bedroom or something and working your way outside? Or how do you Mm -hmm. connect multiple memory palaces, anything like that? Yeah, so I've learned a lot about memory palaces from Anthony. I was kind of um, bearish on them when I first started out and started gaining traction and building an audience. And, you know, my approach was always, yeah, memory palaces are cool, but they're overkill for most day-to-day stuff. And I still believe that. I mean, I still believe if you're going to if you're going to memorize five people's names and faces at a cocktail party, you don't need a memory palace. But 
Anthony really impressed upon me a lot of the, just the sheer power of what you can do with them. And I've experienced it firsthand. I mean, I can, in a minute or so, memorize 50 digits backwards and forwards with a memory palace. So I'll defer to him, and I'm sure he shared a lot of, of really great ideas in his episode around connecting memory palaces and paths and, and stuff like that. I'll share something with your audience that I don't think anyone else is doing that I use pretty religiously and find to be incredibly powerful. Now, I haven't had a chance yet to come up with a very clever name for it, but I kind of, in my mind, refer it to like contextually linked loci, if you will. And the idea is is pretty simple, right? So let's imagine I'm going through a memory palace and I'm memorizing 50 digits backwards and forwards in chunks of two, just for giggles. And let's say that I've got like tape, which is 19, and knife, which would be 28 in major method, right? Well, let's imagine like I could lay a roll of tape anywhere and I could lay a knife down anywhere. And the problem is when you're doing huge amounts of information, you usually won't forget where things are. But in some situations, like for example, medicine, right? How many different parts of the body have major and minor, just as an example. So you might be reusing the same, you know, you have pectorialis major and minor. You have all different kinds of muscles, major and minor, or, you know, dorsal lateral. So you could get very confused if you were using the same visualization. For example, when I think dorsal, I think of a dolphin, (laughs) Uh, you know, dorsal fin. Um, you might get very confused of like what goes where and was this dorsal visualization here or there. So what I do in my memory palaces is I actually link the marker or visualization to the loci in an unforgettable way. So let's say, for example, that I have uh, 19 and I happen to come upon a window. Tape uh, is my visualization for 19. Instead of just laying the roll of tape on the windowsill, I will visualize breaking the window and using the tape to tape the window. Or let's say, for example, I get to the couch and there is a knife, 28, on the couch. Instead of laying the knife on the couch, which I think is what most people do, I will actually imagine that the knife has torn or cut all of, you know, all the way through the couch cushions. And that way I remember like with that visualization and that modification of that particular loci, there's no way that tape goes there. Tape could only be in the window because, you know, the drywall is not cracked. It's the window. And the knife, well, the knife couldn't, you you know, you can't shred glass. So the knife couldn't be there. And so it allows me to really just add an additional encoding of what goes where in my memory palaces. I find it to be very effective. That would help to prevent mixing things up. I noticed that a lot of mine seem to have that kind of stabbing motion as well. So I probably yep. need to make it more specific to the item because if you have a knife stabbing at this low sign, and then you have a screwdriver stabbing at that one, might still get it a little confused. So maybe right. make it more specific to that object that I'm thinking of. Exactly. Uh, and, you know, the knife can have, for example, it can be a serrated knife and that can have different different kind of detail in your marker just as an example. True, versus like a slicing motion with a different type of knife. Yeah, or a hole with a screwdriver kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we have the memory palaces. We have some ways to maybe prevent mixing up different loci. And like you were saying with lateral versus dorsalis versus medial versus all these different, usually anatomical descriptions, there's longest and brevis for long and short. Yep. Then from that aspect and sort of clarifying or more strongly associating the specific object to the low side. Exactly. How do you go about reviewing that? Yeah. So this is a challenging one. I do still like the use of software to do this for a couple of reasons. One, let's be realistic. Like how many of us are actually going to do review if we don't have some system in place that is going to remind us and nag us. So I like the use of software. I'm an outspoken critic of Anki for being too modifiable and too flexible and too customizable and people just get in the weeds and get discouraged. But I do like the fact that you can add custom fields and stuff like that. I don't normally add a custom field for Memory Palace Station. You could, like you could say, oh, this is on the you know left side of the stove on the front burner, for example. 
but you don't really have to. Like what I would do is I would just have the answer and the question. Keep it super simple. When I teach people how to use something like Anki, I say, don't get into the weeds. Don't get tempted. The additional fields just go in your brain. <laughs> you know, remember where it is. Don't even, and I know a lot of people import images in there. I don't even import the images. You know why, Chase? Because people aren't going to keep up with it. They're not going to do the work. When I started doing Russian, I did all kinds, you know, Google image search, drag and drop, add all the pictures, add all the audio, add all the phonetic, you know, spelling. And it, I just didn't keep up with it. It was just too much work. You know what's really easy? Question, answer, boom, go. All the rest of it goes in your brain. That, therefore, when you answer the question, did I get it right or did I get it wrong? You have a scale of one to four. If you got it right, or let's say, for example, you remember where it is in the memory palace, but you didn't get it exactly right. That's not a one or, or a four, right? That might be a three. And so you rate it based on that. And it just makes it so much easier, so much less data entry. But yeah, I do like the use of spaced repetition systems because it's going to cut down so much on what you need to review and you don't want to waste time reviewing stuff that you don't need to review yet. You want to wait until you are on the cusp of forgetting it. Oh, wow. That's, yeah, a lot different. I initially, when I started trying to implement memory palaces, I'd try to sketch them out, but my artistic skills are uh, stick figures for the most part. So <laughs> that can be very difficult to later on remember. It's like, if I review it, then I miss something. I'm not really sure what this visual representation actually means. So it kind of wasn't that helpful for my artistic skills. And like you said, it could go on and use Google image search or even the Picmonic generator for yep. some things. Very fun, but it's going to be very time consuming. And if it's already very time consuming creating the mnemonics, then it's very time consuming creating the recall materials for the mnemonics. A lot of students we just don't have the time to do that yeah. or keep up with well, it. Well, I, I don't want it to be time consuming for people to create the mnemonics. I fundamentally believe you should be able to come up with a marker for anything in two seconds or less. And some things, you know, will come into my mind in split seconds. So I would challenge people, if it's taking you a lot of time to come up with markers, train that. And that's, that's a creativity thing. That's not a visualization thing. And we, we talk about this ad nauseum in my courses because a lot of people, especially people coming from fields where creativity is not appreciated or encouraged or even allowed, for example, accountants should not be upset that they are not, I, I will not say they're not creative because everyone is creative. Accountants should not be upset with themselves that their creativity muscles are not well trained because in their field, creativity is very much frowned upon. In fact, creativity can get you put in jail. And the same, by the way, in, uh, in a lot of fields. So that is a muscle that needs to be trained. And if you're not able to create markers fast enough, you need to work on training creativity. Ben, I definitely need to work on that more. I know I do way too much theory and not enough practice. It's been a very common theme in a lot of my studies in the past. Oh, I do the same thing. I once met with a guru in Thailand and I just he asked me well what is your journey and what path have you been on and I told him I did this and I did that and I did this and I did that and I read this and I did that and he goes okay my son but how often do you actually sit <laughs> like how often do you actually meditate and I was like oh uh not a lot you know so I started sitting a lot more I know we only have a few more minutes here before you're gonna have to go so I really want to know what are some of the last minute kind of challenges or obstacles you see commonly in the students you've had and maybe some quick ways that our audience could overcome those types of obstacles? Yes. The biggest obstacle to your success, and I'm, I'm going to pick on you a little bit here, Chase. The biggest obstacle to your success is either passively listening to these things and not trying them, training them, and practicing them, or going into analysis paralysis. You know, that you reach a certain point where additional learning becomes, I don't know if I can say this on the air, but it becomes masturbation. And at a certain point, again, the information can't create the transformation without the application. The best thing that you can do to improve these skills is to use them every single day. Find excuses. If you, I mean, if you're on break right now, I think a lot of people will be hearing this over Christmas break or over Thanksgiving break or whatever it may be. If you're on break right now, find excuses. Memorize the names of your Uber drivers. Memorize the names of the people who help you at the grocery store. Find ways. I, when I was learning these skills, Anthony and I would sit around at the dinner table 
and we would memorize all the serial numbers of all the Coke cans on the table because why not? Because we could, <laughs> you know, <laughs> open, if you are, if you're sitting on the bus right now and you're listening to this podcast and thinking, how am I going to memorize, you know, how am I going to use these skills? Take out your wallet, memorize your credit cards, memorize the serial numbers on your dollar bills, keep those dollar bills and then have your friends quiz you weeks later. Be like, I'll give you this $10 bill. But uh, if I remember the number on it, three weeks from now, you have to give it back to me and give me one of yours. Ooh, I like it. That definitely adds a little more intrigue to it. And I'm definitely right? guilty of the analysis paralysis and all of that. So one last question. If there's one thing you could go back in time and change, what would it be? Ooh, I don't love this question because I always worry that I worry that I wouldn't end up where I am today. And I, I rather like where I am today and who I am today. And that took a long time and a lot of trials and tribulations to get to. But um, anything in history or in my life? Um, you know, never had anyone ask before. So I suppose it's a dealer's choice. <sighs> it's a tough one. I mean, I think the obvious one is, is you know, go back in time, kill Hitler. But, uh, but then I might not be in the state of Israel, which I think is, is just an, an incredible, wonderful, triumphant place. No, I, you know what? I'm going to plead the fifth on that one. I'm going to say, I don't think, I don't know how time travel works and I'm just, I'm not going to mess with it. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. I think uh, even episode of Doctor Who, they kind of debate going back and killing Hitler and the repercussions of it. So, yep, it's a good one to question. Um <laughs> So where can the audience find out more about you and your new book, The Only Skill That Matters? Yes. So I encourage people to check out superhumanacademy.com. That is where I do all my stuff. Uh, my podcast, Superhuman Academy, we have tons of online courses, products, memberships. We're all over the place. And my latest book is called The Only Skill That Matters. You can learn about that at superhumanacademy.com slash book. And uh, I intentionally wrote it to be a short read. It is 200 pages. If you are in analysis paralysis mode, don't read it. But if some of these new ideas around speed reading, learning, memory, preparation, pre-reading, if these are new ideas to you and you want to learn them in a quick and effective form, I highly recommend picking it up. Some people have said it's rather good. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like it does have some very good reviews so far. And of course, all of these links will be in the show notes in case anyone's unable to write it down currently. Do you have any last minute recommendations for the audience? Yeah, I do actually. So a lot of people think, you know, that when they ask me, how do you use these skills? What do you use them for? What do you recommend using them for? They expect me to say, memorize books or do all kinds of crazy stuff, get a new degree, learn programming. But actually, I would be even more happy if you just use these skills to connect with other human beings in a meaningful way. Learn people's names, remember conversations with friends and loved ones, take time to memorize your friend's birthdays. I think the most powerful ways to use these skills are to just be a better human being. Beautiful. I'm really going to have to try harder at some of those <laughs> memorizations. <laughs> well, Jonathan Levy, thank you so much for coming on the show today. It's been really an honor having you on. Oh, it's my pleasure, Chase. And it's about that time again where I need to ask you for a little favor. In order to grow, the best way is to share this podcast with somebody you know. A lot of people, even friends that I'm connecting with from medical school, have never listened to a podcast still, or they don't know how to find one. So they definitely don't know how to find this show. So make sure they are aware of the useful materials on this show by introducing them personally to the Medical Nemesis podcast and the other materials at freemeded.org. I greatly appreciate all all the support that you give us, and it encourages us to continue making these materials for you. So please share with a friend, share with a class, post on social media. We really, really do appreciate your support. We hope you enjoyed this episode. For links to connect to us, email us, or for previous episodes, please see the show notes. We'd also love to hear from you. So please send an email or join us on the Medical Nemesis Mastermind Facebook group. Any ideas, tips, tricks, people that you'd like to hear interviewed, we'd love to hear it. Any advice to make the show better and more enjoyable would be greatly appreciated.